So what is the principle of conservation of linear momentum? Well, it ties in kind of similar to the work and energy piece where we had the conservation of energy. Um, okay, and basically what it says is total linear mo momentum remains constant within a system if you don't have any outside big forces acting on it. Okay? Um, so how do we say that in a way that kind of kids really understand? We talk about the momentum before a collision is equal to the momentum after a collision. Okay, and you'll see what I'm talking about here in just a second. There's two kinds of collisions that we want to talk about. There is a um, elastic collision, which will, I'll be honest with you, doesn't really exist that much in the real world other than when we say theoretically um, we could have an elastic collision. Because uh, elastic collision means that the total kinetic energy before is equal to the total kinetic energy after a collision. Now, anytime things run into each other, you're always going to get some sort of friction, which usually it leads to heat, which if you lose some of that energy to heat, you can never have the same amount of kinetic energy after the collision. Does this make sense? So the only time we would have an elastic collision is if, in, if we kind of said in theory. Just like in most of the class so far, we've said there's no friction, there's no air resistance, we've done everything in a vacuum. And remember, we had massless strings and all those good things to make this at least conceptually easier for your brain to wrap around. So elastic collision means the total kinetic energy before equals the total, total kinetic energy after. Inelastic collision, which is what we mostly have um, in the real world, the total kinetic energy before does not equal the total kinetic energy after. Okay. Now, guys, as an example of this, this is kind of fun, and this kids, and I got to be careful because kids love to um, do this to a whole bunch of different things. But if we swing over here, and can you hold this up for me? Okay. And this is kind of always a classic example right here. I have two big metal spheres. And if I take them and I do this right here, okay, we get a hole in the paper. Now people are like, yeah, you just hit it really hard, you get a hole in the paper. If you look at that and you smell it, what do you smell? It's burnt. It's burnt. Why is it burnt? Well, because when these two things hit together, some of that energy goes into forming heat, friction, okay, and it actually gets hot enough to burn a hole in the paper. Okay, so if I did it a whole bunch of times, now smell. It's really burning. Definitively burning smell. Okay, so these collisions, when they come together and hit, it looks like they hit and all of the energy got um, conserved. Energy doesn't really always get conserved. There's always some of that energy lost to heat. So when we talk about collisions, um, if we talk about elastic ones, they're kind of all theoretical. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Now, if I were to throw this as hard as I could at Chad and it would hit his skull and it would go indent in his skull, then we'd know for sure that wasn't an elastic collision. It would be inelastic, right, because there's going to be a lot of friction there as well. Okay. Everybody kind of with me? We'll let you play with these. Do not use these on your shirt because they will burn holes in really expensive clothing, okay? Kids have been known to do that before. Okay. All right, so inelastic collisions, elastic collisions, uh, we'll get a little bit better feel of what that looks like here in a second, okay? Now, this example is kind of a classic, okay? I call it the cannon or the gun example. This is where we are going to have two things that are stationary and sitting there, like i.e. a bullet and a gun, or a cannon and a cannonball, and they are going to push off of each other due to some gunpowder or whatever you have in there. Or, like in this example, we'll see they just push off on each other. And guys, we're going to use this idea that the momentum before the collision equals the momentum after, which is the principle of conservation of energy to solve some problems. So really quickly, if we could, let's get two volunteers to come up here, and we're going to throw down on this. So, yeah, we've got to have some guys hustling. Let's get up here. Okay, I got one and um, I got two, okay? So if we can, I want to put um, you right here on that one, if you could. Sit down on that guy. We're going to sit because okay. I don't want him to be right here. <laughs> and then can you sit on this one? Okay. And um, you know what we're going to do? Let's move this right here. Okay, like that. And what I'd like you to do is we're
we're going to push you as close as we can together. If you can, put your feet up on the thing. That would be awesome. I know that's kind of a stretch there. And, and I'm going to scoot you guys together. And what we're going to do is these guys are going to push hard against each other, and they're going to start moving back. Okay? Can you watch him so he doesn't run into that? that you're in a safety valve right there. Okay. Now, guys, really quickly, right now the momentum these two guys have is what? Well, it's their mass times their velocity. How fast is he going? Zero. How fast is he going? So what's their total momentum? Zero. Well, after they push on each other, their total momentum is going to be still zero. Okay? If energy is not always conserved in collisions, but momentum is, okay? That's what we said right here. So it's going to be kind of interesting. He's going to be moving that way. So he's going to have momentum, but it's going to be what? Negative momentum. He's going to be moving this way, and he's going to have positive momentum. If you add negative and positive momentum together, could you see how you could come back to zero? You guys kind of with me here? Okay. So let's give these guys a push. Sorry, it's hard to sit there for that long. Is it? Okay, and you, you got him. Okay, let's do this. Let's move you guys this way a little bit. He's a little bit more massive, and so what do you think? Is he going to come off flying faster and further? Or is he going to? Okay, I think you guys are all right. Now, Newton's third law says when he pushes on him, he pushes on him, he pushes on him. So the forces should be what? Equal, right? Okay, so let's throw down. Ready? Three, two, one, push. Okay, so pretty obvious. He went off with a smaller velocity. He went off with a bigger velocity. Now, come back together really quickly. If... Now, this is a pretty, pretty obvious thing. If you're going to shoot a bullet and you want the bullet to go really, really, really fast, what is kind of the key? Well, the mass of the gun or the cannon better be significantly higher than that of the bullet. If you have equal mass on the gun and the bullet and you want the bullet to go 1,000 meters per second, well, the gun's going to come off going what? 1,000 meters per second, if they're equal mass. Okay? I.e., really quickly, Wyoming terms, if you don't want the gun to pound into your shoulder and recoil really, really big, what's the number one thing you can do? Okay? Make a really heavy, heavy, massive gun, okay? which stinks to carry around, but then it doesn't hit you in the shoulder quite as hard. Does this make sense? Okay, you guys did awesome. Nice work. Okay? I got you. Okay, All right. Thank you, sirs. So let's look at an example really quickly that ties that together. Okay? Now, I had him standing up on here in the drawing. You guys can laugh if you want. That's pretty painful, I know. But this, this guy has a mass of 75 kilograms, and we know afterwards he's going to be going back one meter per second. This guy is a mass of 30 kilograms, and what we're going to try to do is find the velocity of that person. Now, in this, I should have done a gun example probably, but guys, this is the classic way that we used to figure out how fast bullets would go. It's, when you shoot a rifle, you can measure the velocity of it going backwards because you can actually see the rifle moving backwards and you can measure that. So you could measure this velocity, and from those things, we could then calculate how fast the bullet was going. Does that kind of make sense? Or how fast the cannonball was going. So if we look at this example, we say, the momentum before the collision equals the momentum after. Okay? So in this case, what's the momentum before? Well, we talked about that. Both the guys were going <coughs> zero. So the total momentum before the collision is zero, right? After the collision, the one of them's gonna have mass and velocity, the other one's gonna have mass and velocity. So we plugged in 75 times negative one, and then plus. So guys, if you notice here, we can uh, we have our mass of our person, and he's going negative one. After the collision, we got 30. We're looking for the unknown velocity. We solve for that. We come up with a velocity of 2.5 meters per second. Does it make sense that that would be the right answer? Well, let's think about it. Is this guy more massive or less massive? Less massive. So you saw in the example, the less massive guy came out going faster, didn't he? Okay. In this case, he's coming out 2.5. This guy was negative one. But if we look, guys, this is negative momentum. This guy's going to have positive momentum. You add them together, the momentum after the collision is going to be zero. Momentum before equals momentum after. Does that make sense? Classic way of figuring out how fast a bullet 
was going before we had chronographs. Okay? All right. Now, if we could, let's step over to this other classic example. And this is going to be a collision where this is a truly inelastic collision where the ball comes in and they stick together. You guys, on almost every physics test you'll ever take, at the, at the college level, there's going to be a train car coming in and sticking with another train car and they're going to move off. Does this kind of make sense? Okay. So can I get one more um, volunteer? Uh, this person has to catch. Okay. Come on up. Okay. Cool, cool. So what we're going to do is we're going to throw uh, that guy on there. I'm going to grab this big heavy ball. I want, you to, I want you to feel this heavy ball though before you get on there. So can you... Okay. Pretty heavy, right? Okay. Now I'm going to throw it to you and you catch it. So let's practice you standing. Okay. Stand up for a second. Let's practice you catching it, standing up. Okay. Can you catch that thing when you're on the car? Yeah, like standing up? Well, no. Yeah, just sit down on that thing. Yeah, that could be a total disaster. Okay. All right. So guys, what we're going to do is I'm going to throw the ball at him pretty hard. He's going to catch it, and then we're going to see what happens afterwards. So the ball is going to be flying in with what? Momentum. It's going to have momentum, he's going to catch it, they're going to stick together, and that momentum should be conserved. Now, I, you guys are pretty smart, if the ball's coming really fast and then they stick together, or is he and the ball going to move off faster or slower? Slower, because there's more mass there, right? Does this make sense? So we're going to demo this, you sure you got this, man? Catch it with, don't catch it with straight arms, okay, because it'll hurt. Okay, you ready? Oh, jeez, here we go, you ready? Three. Two, one. <laughs> that was kind of head out of bad. Okay? So, the whole, I got to throw it harder, I think. Can you catch it if I throw it harder? Yeah, do you want me to scoop forward? No, you're good right back. there. That's perfect right there. You ready? Three, two, one. There we go. We got some right there. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay? Now, guys, if, if the ball was coming in faster, then he would have moved off, they would have moved off a little bit faster. But the idea is, you guys are pretty smart, if you throw more mass into the system and you have the same amount of momentum, then the velocity has to go what? <coughs> has to go down, right? Okay, so let's look real quick. And this is pretty important, sometimes kids, kids get confused with this one. Momentum before the collision, we have the mass of the ball times the velocity of the ball. The mass of the person times the velocity of the person. Now, before the collision, the person was going, was sitting there going zero, right? So what happens to that whole term? Goes to zero. So the momentum before really is the only momentum before is the momentum of the what? The ball, right? Okay. Now, afterwards, and this is the hard part for some kids. Afterwards, because the masses stick together, we have to actually add them together into one new mass. So we take the mass of the ball plus the mass of the person times their new velocity, and that's going to be equal to the momentum after. Does that make sense to everybody? Since they're stuck together, we're going to have to treat them as one mass, and then they have one velocity. Okay. So if we look at that, we go uh, mass of 7 times 10, which gives us 70 kilogram meters per second of momentum before the collision, and then after the collision, we got the mass of the ball plus the mass of the person times the new velocity that we don't know. So we get 77 times that, we divide over, and we get a new velocity of the ball and the person of 0.9, what, 0.91 meters per second. Which if we check to see if it makes sure, may make sense, the ball was coming in at 10 meters per second. When they stuck together, they went off at something that was less than one. Okay. Now, you guys are really pretty smart. If the ball mass and the person's mass keeps getting closer and closer together, when you throw it at them, are they going to move off at, well, increasing amounts of velocity? And if the person keeps getting bigger and the ball isn't getting any bigger, then they're going to move. Well, you saw the very first time I threw it, he barely moved at all. What do you think? Can you guys handle those? Okay. These two examples are kind of really, really classic examples of impulse momentum. To finish off here, guys, and this one's kind of important. This one is obvious, I think, to everybody, but this one you can use when you play dodgeball the next time. Okay? 
It says, which delivers a bigger impulse? A dodgeball that hits you in the face and bounces off in what, what would be more like an elastic collision or a dodgeball that hits you in the face and sticks, okay? So for instance, I, and you guys have all played dodgeball. Back when I was a kid, you didn't have the nice squishy softballs. You had those big red ones with like a, the tra traction on them. So like if you got hit the rest of the day, everybody knew it because you had that imprint on your face, right? And so you'd swing back and you'd throw that thing. And if you guys had to guess, which one's going to deliver a bigger impulse to your face? The one that hits and sticks or the one that hits and bounces off? Okay. Well, and you guys are probably looking up here. The one that delivers the bigger change in momentum, right? That ball's coming in. It has momentum. If it hits your face and then bounces off, it had a pretty big change in momentum because it had positive momentum. Now it has negative momentum. That's a big change. If it hits and sticks, that's all it did was lose its initial momentum. It didn't bounce back off. Okay? So let's check this out really quickly. Before, ah, that's an awesome face right there coming in. Afterwards, it's hit his face. Notice it's flatter and it's coming back out. So I drew all that by myself. Um, the momentum before, it had positive momentum. Coming out, it's got negative momentum. So the change in momentum is equal to the final minus the initial. So we get negative 20 minus 20. We actually get a negative 40 kilogram meters per second um, change in momentum, which is also equal to the impulse. So when the ball hit the face and bounced back, there was a impulse that was 40 kilogram meters per second in magnitude and in a negative direction. Now if it hits and sticks, so before it's coming in, it's got momentum of 20 kilogram meters per second. After, oh, I forgot the I. It sticks on the face right there. Then the change in momentum, okay, the ball afterwards had zero kilograms, so the change is only negative 20 kilogram meters per second. Okay. So what kind of dodgeballs do you want to play with if you want to inflict the most pain? Ones that will bounce back off of the face. Okay, ones that just stick to the face, not so good. That's why when you play with a Nerf dodgeball and the Nerf dodgeball hits and it like squishes and sticks to the face, it doesn't hurt nearly as much as when you play with the big old red ball that goes in and hits and bounces back off the face. Okay, to give you a more practical example of this that I think everybody can um, really relate to, there are really, really big raindrops out there that are, that are massive that come down and hit your car. They don't ever dent your car because when they hit your car, they, they flex and that a lot of that energy gets absorbed and they basically hit your car and stink. Okay? Hailstones of equal mass will come down and they will dent your car because why? 